Uh, John's been looking after the data management service at CSIRO, which he established. Um, and I was just chatting to John about his job there. And uh, it's, it's nice. I think he answers this question to his CIO occasionally. The CIO says, well, what do you do, John? He says, well, I talk to everyone from the desktop to the big research programs that are st st strategic and international that we host here at CSIRO. So it sounds like a broad scope. Um, I think John's going to try and explain to us how he takes a sort of a st strategic view of that and tries to make it sustainable. So please join me in welcoming John. Well, thanks for coming. Um, I've got the wonder power here, so this should be interesting. Okay, so we've gone out and we've built a digital repository. And the interesting, you know, this, this is the sorts of things I'm going to talk about today. So we, basically, I'll just get a couple of quick slides on what the DAP is today. We're in for some fairly challenging times in CSRO, so is the rest of the sector. But I actually see that as an opportunity more than a liability at the moment. Um, those, those interesting and challenging times are sort of making us do a bit of top-down planning. So uh, we've been doing building lots and lots of services. I don't know if you've been to any of our previous talks, but we were talking about how a lot of our development work is actually researcher-driven. So we work from the desktop up, the ground up. And uh, with the challenging times, we've got some planning activities from the top down, which I'll talk about. I uh, just come back from the e-science conference in Chicago, uh, where I've actually seen the EarthCube talk at that, at that. And there's some interesting sort of observations out of that. And then uh, to putting all that together uh, with some planning activities, which only just finished last Friday, so this is recent, pretty recent stuff. Uh, I'll talk about some of the things that we're probably going to sort of invest in uh, over the next 12 to 18 months. So the DAP, I stole these slides. This is data reuse, okay? So I stole these slides off uh, Jerry and Sue, who gave a, a, a talk there uh, uh, previously. Now, when you actually sort of look at the data access portal, it was a place to start. When you actually sort of go around the organisation and you sort of say, well, okay, we've got this really cool tool, um, how happy are you about it? Well, what you find is the IP managers love it. The uh, legal people, they love it. The researchers go, yeah, I can see some reasons for using it, but I'm not too sure yet. So we're in that stage of actually building up sort of uh, the use of our data access portal and then sort of proving the value to the researchers. Now, basically, with that particular, uh, here's the slide that uh, Sue sort of put up very, very briefly and then sort of said, John's going to talk about this. So I better actually sort of say a few words about it. Um, Google Analytics, well, we run that across our DAP because of the fact that what researchers actually like to see is where, where is my data going? So is it just, you know, within CSIRO it's being used and, or is it uh, going international? And what we're actually finding is we're getting a lot of uh, interest from China, getting lots of interest from Europe and lots of interest from the US. So it is actually quite a global system with lots and lots of people using it. Um, sensor networks. Well, sensor networks and CSIRO are actually getting to be big and interesting things. When you start dealing with trying to put data from a sensor network straight into a data repository, you get some really interesting issues around actually people wanting to actually see the data really quickly. So you have to pro do that whole process very rapidly. You start to come up against sorts, sorts of limitations around databases and how they work and I.O. and all sorts of things. It's not a, a simple thing of sort of archiving data from a month ago. They actually want to see the stuff turn up in the data access portal and be able to actually start sucking it down almost immediately. That's the sort of brief we're looking at and how we actually make that work. Will we get there? Yeah, I don't know. We'll see how we go. Interoperability. Well, with your data access portals, okay, it's a way for CSRO to publish its data, but we collaborate in a whole pile of other communities. There's the uh, TURN, there's IMOS, there's a whole pile of things that basically we, put, we get people to go through the workflow in the, in the data access portal, and then the data access portal basically takes that data and puts it into those communities or makes it visible to those communities. Because your researchers, I mean, our data access portal is around Joe Public being able to look at the data and having a bit of a brief look at things. It doesn't talk about the, uh, the in-depth metadata that you might want to use when you're actually doing sort of geospatial searches or something like that. Um, we have actually at the moment separate publishing repositories and data repositories. Um, they're pretty similar in process and technologies. Logically, from an IT point of view, you probably want to bring those uh, closer together, or at least make sure that you can sort of jump from one to the other, saying, oh, putting my paper in, oh, I'll put the link into the data right now. So there's a bit of uh, closer linking that we need to, to look at there. 
Search by location. Now, this is interesting. How much functionality do you put into your data access portal? There's geo networks, there's geo server, there's a whole pile of really cool ways of actually searching data geospatially. You can draw wiggly shapes around things, you can do it with bounding boxes, you can do all sorts of things. Building that functionality into, a, into your central repository is Irish. It's just not the thing to do. There are other tools out there that people prefer to use, let them use them. Just make your repository do what repositories do well, if, if there's any sort of advice I can sort of give. Um, so linking to other data repositories in CSIRO, we're not the only data repository in the organisation. There are some long-lived repositories that, okay, over time, from an IT point of view, we will probably want to run a big central repository because it's easy for the IT guys and things like that. But there are large collections of data out there in the water, uh, oceans area, where they actually have good, strong reasons for keeping the data where it is. They've got major compute near that stuff, and we just need to reference it until we'll probably life cycle it out over the few years. Machine to machine functionality, uh, web services. Okay, data reuse doesn't work unless you're actually willing to open up your repository with various APIs and things to allow other people to build services on top of your data repository. I mean, it's a pretty primitive interface. We have a requirement in the organisation for flagships and things like that to present data to different communities in ways those communities uh, like to see it. So, climate change community like to see their data in a particular format, they like to see a particular subset of data. Building portals on the top of these things is what we try to encourage you know, people to do, but it's not part of the data access portal, but we need to have, actually advertise our APIs and make it more available. So that's the sorts of things that we are actually going to do with the data access portal. Challenging times. Well, here's where a bit of the rubber hits the road. Uh, you may have noticed the government's starting to claw back a lot of our money. Uh, in CSIRO, the boss came around and sort of said, um, capital, uh, we don't have that anymore and uh, you need to do what you need to do with your operational money. It changes your way of thinking. <laughs> so, because a lot of our development projects are capitalised. So, uh, a lot of our resources have disappeared. So, actually, I don't think that's a bad thing sometimes, because what it does is you then say, well, okay, with no money, what, I, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to actually put a bit more effort into sort of planning, making the sorts of services we've already got used you know, use to the max, I mean, we've got lots and lots of stuff coming online with NCRIS. We've got the new NCI machines. And at the moment, um, I think a lot of those things will come online when we actually use all the capacity. So with no money coming in for capital, what we're going to be doing is actually spending a lot of effort on actually trying to get our researchers to be aware of these new services and actually get them to use them. So NCI, watch out. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, uh, you know, the super science investments, things like that. It was interesting asking a question around the organisation, which one of these things matter? And, and, you know, like if ALA goes away tomorrow, what sort of effect is that going to have on the research? Um, it's an ongoing discussion in CSIRO. And, you know, this is where you sort of sit there and say, well, okay, how is CSIRO going to sort of still support some of these things? And which ones do we really, really, really care about? Um, okay. If you start getting people enthused about your services, they're going to want to use more of them. That becomes challenging when you've only got a fixed amount of capital. Uh, at the moment, we're actually pretty, in pretty good shape because we've just life cycled a lot of our machines and we've got a couple of years to go of people you know, using that capacity. Um, so you know, we're going to have a bit, of a bit of a struggle with sort of lack of capacity. One of the things that is sad is, okay, free services like the cloud is free is really wonderful for researchers. It's crap for the poor old guys in IT who sit there and say, I've got to compete against a free service, especially when you're trying to sort of ask the boss for more money. Why do you need more money? They can put it all on the cloud. Wonderful conversation. Green computing, the energy costs of actually storing stuff on spinning disk are becoming quite horrendous. Uh, we can't actually get enough power into our compute centers anymore. So we have to be a bit more novel about using sort of made technologies, tape, a whole pile of other things to make our energy efficiency of our data centers a lot better. Problem is, that's transition costs. So you've got to plan your life cycles and things like that. Okay, one of the things I do in the organization, uh, with all, all services we've been building so far, they've been developed from the bottom up. We've engaged with the researchers. What do you want? We'll build it for you. When you've got no money to do things, you've then got to sit there and say, well, okay, we've got less money. Um, 
how do I prove the worth with the senior leaders in the organisation to get them to invest their meagre resources into your program? So we've gone, I've spent the last 12 months wandering around to all our flagships. We've got 11 of them at the moment. And, so, and actually raising the awareness of actually what e-research is. Um, basically, in, in CSRO, flagships draw on capabilities from right across the whole organisation. So we're presenting ourselves as another capability. Problem is, they don't actually understand what we are. They don't actually, so you say e-research to a researcher and they go, uh, or a senior researcher, and they go, yeah, what's that, you know? Well, isn't that just ICT? Doesn't that the you know, central IT group take care of that? So creating the value proposition to the senior uh, researchers in the organisation and the people with the money is kind of challenging. Um, now, with working with these guys, I've actually got each of them to actually present or think about their own strategic e-research plans for each of the flagships. And I've actually, which is a challenging thing, because they are fairly competitive, I've actually got them to share them in an open access sort of way. So they've all got their written their little plans and they've all actually shared them out amongst each other on a SharePoint site and they're comparing plans and thinking, oh, I just didn't think about that. Yes, we need some of that as well. Oh, I understand things, okay. Um, when you're working with some of these people, they're busy, you need to make sure you're ready when they are. So, that sort of things. Okay, flagships, what do they have in common? Um, they all work right across the whole organisation. Everybody's, uh, we are very geographically dispersed and that means you've got to build sort of collaborative environments to support that sort of thing. So they're interested in collaborative environments. Um, they are also interested in sort of working uh, globally, internationally, uh, and that sort of creates some sort of challenging sorts of things. There is an increasing need for openness and transparency and the use of data. Now, in government, they're investing billions of dollars in our research and actually kind of want to see a return on that. So what we're actually sort of seeing is you see in the CSIRO strategy, they have this thing called the trusted advisor. It's pretty hard to trust somebody who doesn't share the data with you. So this is sort of one of the drivers that we use to sit there and say, okay, this is why we have a data access portal and this is why we share our data. Um, so that's the key trends there. Um, the, the flagships are, you know, noticing finally that, you know, they're doing a lot of modeling, a lot of data, but they also need to get the people involved. And when you talk about connecting models and data, the people they've got to connect to are Joe Public, they've got to connect to the state governments, they've got to connect to the federal government. You have to build different environments for each of those sorts of things that actually can be quite challenging for, uh, for flagships. Okay, so how does a flagship see the world? Well, they, they see the ICT group, which is a research group. Well, they must do all the good R&D stuff. There's uh, other things in CSRO, NICTA, people we can work with. Um, I see researchers, okay, they're, they're actually, this is actually a slide that actually stole off a, a flagship guy, and this is how they actually see it. So this is actually a bit of a step forward. So we've got various sorts of things we can draw on. And Chris, there's a whole pile of other capabilities. They're starting to sort of take this whole capability view. They have their own informatics research domain people within their flagships. And then basically, whoops, oh well, won't worry about that. <laughs> um, yes. So basically, um, you know, they see this sort of the whole thing is the flagship needs a bit of uh, support from the operational group in CSRO, the IMT group. They're starting to value the support they get from the e-research group because they actually see that as applying the IT to their problem. And they want us to work very closely with their informatics teams. And they're taking all the new stuff that the ICT guys do and, and applying that to the various things. Okay, so there are two sides of everything. We have current services. So one of the first questions we asked the flagships when we were talking to them is, what do you think of our current services? What are the issues? So we have our five or six current services. There's the planning service, that's me. There used to be two of us. The other one was Liam. Um, so basically, they want us to get out and about more. It's a big organisation. That is challenging. I've been to all 53 sites, so and I'll probably go back again this year. Um, advanced collaboration services. We use a hell of a lot of video conferencing internally in the organisation. They see this as a great asset. It, it, the amount of savings alone in travel in the organisation is absolutely tremendous. They want that service to go externally. They want anybody in the university to be able to access it. And we're actually in the process now of upgrading all our video conferencing stuff so that if you've got an iPad, you can video conference at CSIRO. So that'll be available probably by towards the end of the year. Uh, they want to see shared workspaces. Okay. Uh, um, so basically, uh, these are the sorts of things where 
okay, uh, shared authentication systems, AAF, and all this sorts of stuff. So there's all sorts of really cool things. Um, so this is a look at what the, the current stuff. There's another slide of this. I've got to hurry because I've got to get going. Okay, so the new services. The big question they gave, as soon as they saw that, they said, that's nice. That takes care of this much of our, much of our problem. We've got working data. It's over here. How do I manage that? That's our major next, uh, next uh, challenge for the, the research. You can't solve it as a single monolithic tool. You've actually got to look at sort of things that, uh, little tools to sort of help people gather things like provenance and all that sort of stuff around the, around the organisation. So uh, I think, you know, that's probably going to be our focus over the next 18 months, looking at sort of tools and methodologies for actually preparing data, collecting metadata as people do things, and actually getting it into, into the, uh, uh, the portal and, and allowing it to share internally. Um, awareness, there's a whole pile of things. Look, you can get all this sort of stuff later because I'm running out of time. Let's go down to global trends. Interesting thing out of the US is reproducibility of your science. Not only do you have to share your data, you have to share your software and all these other little, and your publications, but the thing is they want to be able to push a button and rerun your model. When they actually tried to do this on some of the workflows in my, my research, my experiment, they actually found that 95% of the workflows didn't work anymore because the versions of software had changed, the, the data set formats had changed, the algorithms probably still work, but you know, uh, some of the grid technologies that they relied on weren't there anymore. So that's an interesting problem to solve. Um, I'm not too sure whether sort of VMs and things like that are going to help us in that area, but yeah, it's an interesting area for Lewis. Hub Zero is an interesting environment. Uh, it's a way of actually putting a nice, pretty front end on researcher code, and it's something we're going to be having a bit of a look at as a possible sort of environment for CSIRO. Um, Australia is actually doing pretty well when you compare to the States. I think you know, the vibe here is a lot more interesting, a lot more varied, a lot more exciting. Um, so I think we're doing actually quite well there. So what are we going to be doing over the next 12 months? We're going to be getting out and about more. One of the things we're going to be building is an organisational metadata collector. We have lots and lots of data about researchers. They hate typing in the same data twice. You know, because you work for the organisation, you appear in our HR system. We're going to harvest the data out of that and use it to populate the stuff in the DAP and a whole pile of other things. So you don't have to keep typing in the same crap over and over again. We have a science investment planning tool. We're going to harvest that for the metadata about projects. So we're actually going to start collecting data in a sort of a central area that's metadata about the organisation, and then using that in all these sorts of tools to actually sort of cut down on the typing. Um, do we publish software in the DAP? Well, as I said before, the my experiment thing is sort of making us rethink that a little bit. What do you actually publish in software? Um, that's basically working data. That's a big problem. I could talk about that for a long time, but the man standing there being very excited. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of those areas where we're going to sort of look at what's out there, use what's out there. I mean, tools like R and NetCDF have things in there for tracking provenance, but we actually need to harvest that provenance data properly and sort of integrate that better with that. that. I won't worry about this because it's not very interesting. Um, okay, if you want to know more, we do have a booth. There's all sorts of uh, tools and things uh, out there, and um, please visit, and we're happy to chat more. Questions? <laughs> I said there were 16 slides, but I'm very busy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. No no time. Time. We do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if I could just ask you to come up to the microphone with your question and state your name. You're looking very you're quizzical. You can have a question written all over you. <laughs> so any questions? I'll ask you. Ah, good. I'm starting to feel sad. Nobody listening. <laughs> David Flanders from ANS. Um, so you guys are really leading the sector in a lot of, you know, the, the data.csiro and then the integration with other things. Um, what will you guys do to make that available to the rest of the community so that they can learn from your, your good practice and what you're doing on, okay. you know, it's such an advanced level. The data access portal, we are open sourcing that. That should be open for release uh, with what, three? Three weeks. So that'll be uh, out there for people to use. It's basically a workflow over a pretty standard repository. Um, we've actually had lots of interest from government around using that, so all the things that we're building, we're going to open source and make available, uh, mainly because of the fact that if we do that and some of you people adopt it, it makes it a lot easier for us to work with you. 
Um, and you know, there's an awful lot of uh, investment and thought and planning gone in some of these things. We think they're pretty good tools. Use them, abuse them if you don't like them. You know, <laughs> there are other, other form, forms of way of doing it, but yeah. So any other good questions? So everything we do is going to be open source. We're trying to make ourselves more open than data. It's kind of scary, really, but so it's a, a real cultural change for CSIRO in a lot of ways. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I'll ask you to join me in thanking John again for the talk. <laughs>